The LifeWatch community is grateful that Reverend Dr. David F. Watson will serve the Word of God this morning in our midst. As today's bulletin indicates, Dr. Watson is Professor of New Testament, Vice President for Academic Affairs, and Academic Dean all at United Theological Seminary in Dayton, Ohio. His degrees are from Texas Tech University, Perkins School of Theology, and Southern Methodist University. Dr. Watson is the author of books. His most recent is Scripture and the Life of God, why the Bible matters today more than ever. And words flow from his mind, heart, and fingertips that take the shape of countless articles and blogs. Not shame on you, David. <laughs> I believe Reverend Dr. Watson's ministry is distinguished in the United Methodist Church today for four reasons. First, he is one of those rare academics who willingly gets dirty in the trenches of the church, of the United Methodist Church. Second, he is always a peaceful presence, as we say today, in our church. Third, he routinely points to the glorious light of revelation and offers the lesser but essential light of reason on the topics he addresses. And fourth, he mentors many students attracted by his ministry to become faithful servants of Christ and his church. Dr. Watson, we will gladly hear you serve God's word and offer the church's faith on this day. Thank you, thank you uh, Paul, for that introduction. Thank you uh, for inviting me to be here today. I am very appreciative. Thank you for uh, Paul Crickler, who has done so much to get this organized and is such a faithful attendee of these events. Thank you, Dr. Susan Henry Crow, for having us here today. It's an honor to be here in this historic building. Um, before I should get, begin, if I, if I sound or become more hoarse today, I, I just want to apologize. I've been in Cuba for 10 days, and the combination of travel and no sleep hasn't been really good for my voice, but I'll, I'll do my best. I once wrote on my blog that I felt secularism is dangerous. A former student of mine, uh, before I was teaching in the seminary at a different institution, uh, wrote back incredulously, secularism is dangerous? Her meaning, I think, is that religious people have done more than their share of harm in the world. And in that, I agree with her. But I maintain that for all the liabilities that attend religious belief, the Christian faith has the capacity to lead us into an ethic of life, while secularism will lead us into an ethic of death. Our scripture teaches us that each man and woman is fearfully and wonderfully made, bearing the divine image, standing as the pinnacle of God's creation. A secular worldview, however, tends to assess the value of people based on such criteria as cost, 
utility, and convenience. In the early church, there emerged what we now call two ways theology. We see this at the beginning of the ancient document called the Didache, which begins, there are two ways, one of life and one of death. And there is a great difference between the two ways. Secularism is both dangerous and deadly, but equally dangerous and equally deadly is a religious tradition that has adopted the values of secularism, dressed them up in pious language and called them Christian. And when so many believe themselves to live within a Christian nation, it is natural that we would begin to believe that the values widely held in this nation are Christian values. But such is not necessarily so, and I would suggest most often is not. The human mind, said John Calvin, is a factory for the making of idols. The human mind, regardless of the nation in which one happens to live, it is disordered by sin. God's ways are not our ways. God's thoughts are not our thoughts. We can't see the world in the right way apart from the atoning work of Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit. On our own, we don't know who we are. We don't know whose we are. We don't know the origin of human life, nor do we know its intended telos. Historian Felipe Fernandez Armesto puts the matter cogently. Humanity is in peril, not from the familiar menace of mass destruction and ecological overkill, but from a conceptual threat. By ourselves, we are incapable of knowing who and what we really are. And it is only through the divine revelation given to us in scripture that we can begin to comprehend our identity and worth as human beings. Consider the words of Psalm 8. What are human beings that you are mindful of them, mortals that you care for them? You have made them a little lower than God and crown them with glory and honor. It would be easy for us to think that this psalm is about the greatness of humanity. After all, we like to ponder our own greatness. That's what the story of the Tower of Babel is all about. We marvel at what we've done, at what we've achieved, and what we have built but the words of Christ echo in the background. Do you see these great buildings? Not one stone will be left here upon another and all will be thrown down. The God who called the universe into being out of nothing, who brought order out of chaos and breathed life into his creatures is probably not especially impressed with the eye watch. <laughs> the main topic of Psalm 8 is not the greatness of humanity, but the majesty of God. Human beings figure into this psalm because we stand within the context of God's creation. We're part of a larger universe which displays the glorious and majestic nature of God. And as part of this creation, we are led to ask, what's so special about us? What, with all the beauty of the creation around us, why would God care so much about us. Now notice that the psalm doesn't answer this question by saying, because human beings are so smart, or because we can use tools, or because we're artistic. In fact, the story of the Tower of Babel in Genesis 11 tells us that human ingenuity can become a source of arrogance, distancing us from God and bringing upon us divine retribution. Rather, the psalmist gives the reason that God cares about humans. It's not because, when the psalmist gives the reason, it's not because of anything humans have done at all. It is entirely a gift on the part of God. You, 
have made them a little lower than God. You have crowned them with glory and honor. You have given them dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under their feet. You, O oh God, have made us what we are. We are a little lower than God, or another translation might be a little lower than the heavenly beings. But either way, consider the significance of that statement. What could we possibly do to deserve this honor? Nothing. We've done nothing to deserve it. In fact, we've done much not to deserve it. It is a gift born from God's love. And so the attitude of the psalm is one of gratitude. God has gifted us with this special relationship, and it is our unique relationship to God that defines us as human. If this is the case, then there is no circumstance that can for one moment diminish the inherent value of any human life. God has determined the value of human life. We are created, says scripture, in God's image. Genesis 1, 27. So God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. When Jesus is asked about pain, taxes in the temple. He basically says, sure, pay the tax. Give back to Caesar the coin that bears his image. The coin is just a means to an end. It's a way of getting by, but the whole person who bears God's image belongs to God. So render unto Caesar what is Caesar's, but render unto God what is God's. All of creation belongs to God, but we human beings belong to God in a particular way. We're created in God's image. All of creation is good, but only human beings bear the divine image. Now, what does this mean that we bear the image of God? It's a difficult question to answer. Augustine and Aquinas identify intellect and rationality as the markers of the divine image. To bear the image of God is to have intellect and reason. Now, were this to be a gathering of Roman Catholics, I would be loath to disagree with either of these revered teachers, especially Aquinas. But since we are a gathering of, of United Methodists, um, many of whom would identify as evangelical, the only sacrosanct thinkers are likely John Wesley and possibly William J. Abraham. <laughs> and Professor Abraham, in my experience, has never backed away from an intellectual barroom brawl with Roman Catholic teaching. <laughs> in that tradition, then, please indulge me for a moment while I disagree with both Augustine and Aquinas, though I feel a bit like a mouse dressing down two large elephants. <laughs> Nevertheless, we simply cannot identify the divine image with intellect and rationality. And there is a very simple reason for this. To do so would mean that were we to lose our capacities of intellect and rationality, we would lose a divine image. Or prior to that state in our development, when we have intellect and rationality, we would not bear the divine image. We'd have to think of people with dementia as gradually losing the image of God. We'd have to think of people with profound intellectual disabilities as beings who may look human and be born of human parents, but lack the true image of God. The equating of humanity and intellect seems to have permeated Western thinking very deeply. Perhaps that's one of the reasons that 80 to 90% of pregnancies in which Down syndrome is detected are aborted, often at the urging of medical practitioners. In fact, in Iceland, people with Down syndrome have been almost entirely eliminated as a people group by means of prenatal testing and abortion. Why is this allowed? Why are we not calling this what it is? Eugenics. Perhaps the reason is that people with diminished intellectual capacities are somehow seen as less than 
less than the rest of us, less than human. If I might channel my inner Stanley Hauer loss for a moment, let me suggest that people with diminished intellectual capacities challenge the most cherished value of a liberal society, which is individual freedom. You see, if we can think, we can do, we can achieve. We have freedom and, and freedom or choice has become the value above all other values. We want freedom to do what we want, to shape our identity and destiny. Today we have the freedom even to defy our biology, to reshape with the scalpel our appearance and even our gender. People with diminished intellectual capacities don't fit the template of human beings as entirely free, autonomous, and rational agents, and therefore they're viewed as aberrations. The theologian uh, Hans Reinders summarizes this nicely. The culture of modernity, according to Hauerwas, seeks to get rid of people whose very existence makes a mockery of its most cherished ideal, namely the individual freedom. That individual freedom defines the moral meaning of a human being. And once again, we pile stone upon stone, rebuilding the Tower of Babel ever skyward, celebrating what we can do rather than living into what God has already done. As an academic, I like reason. I'm all for it. In fact, <clears throat> I often wish there were more of it in this world. But to equate humanity with intellect is an erroneous notion that has had tragic consequences. To return to Hans Reinders for a moment, who is one of the premier theologians of disability in the world today. He argues for a different understanding of the divine image, one that is specifically beholden to the Christian understanding of God as the Holy Trinity. To be created in the image of God, he says, has nothing to do with our capacities. It means that we are created to be drawn into loving relationship with God and one another. Consider the nature of the Christian God. God is three persons existing in a unity of divine love. God is love, and love is necessarily relational. Thus, to be created in the image of God means that we are created to be in relationship with God and one another. It is not good that we should be alone. We're created for togetherness. Some people think much better than others. I'm reminded of this every time I go on to Facebook. Some people are impaired in their ability to think. Some people have more freedom than others. Some people have no freedom at all. And many will take this to mean that some people are more human than others. But such a sentiment is inhumane, and more than that, it is cruel. Not all human beings can think, but all human beings can be a relationship to God and other people. Not all people can love, but all people can be loved, loved uniquely by God and loved by one another. If only we knew this. If only we could see the divine image in ourselves and in others. If only we knew we were made a little lower than God, how much sadness and death we could avoid. The serpent in the garden has continued to speak through the ages. Did God really say? No, surely that can't be. The world around us, the whole world is telling us something different, that we make ourselves into who we will become. We're self-made people. We are our own masters. We bear those images we choose, images that convey attractiveness and sophistication and wealth and style. We stamp ourselves with clothing and tattoos and surgically alter our bodies in vain attempts to define ourselves apart from God. Did God really say that you and I bear the divine image? Did God really say that those other people, the ones who are inconvenient for us, 
the ones who don't like us, the ones we really don't like, are created a little lower than God and are crowned with glory and honor. Through the years, we've found myriad ways to answer this question with a resounding no. Human beings have achieved feats of genius in our attempts to dehumanize the other, to make ourselves more and others less, and often with tragic and lethal consequences. History of, is rife with examples of how we make our tribe, our race, our people, our nation somehow more human than those unlike us. We hear that a fetus is not human, as if the image of God only appears after a certain point in the pregnancy. We call people with severe brain injuries vegetables. We call people of other cultures savages. We all know the tragic history of dehumanization of European Jews. Our history in this nation is rife with examples of the dehumanization of people of color. And we should not be so naive as to think that the prenatal genocide against people with Down syndrome will not eventually extend to people with other disabilities. We are in rebellion, not simply against our creator, but against the way in which we are created. There are two ways, one of life and one of death, and there's a great difference between the two ways. And if the church will not rise up and proclaim loudly the value of human life, the divine image within each and every person, then there is literally no hope. There's no hope for a people who don't know who they are, and there's no hope for a church that will not live into its calling. So, O oh God, revive us. Remind us who we are. Come, Holy Spirit, and be our teacher. Teach us to see ourselves as you see us. Four hours after my son Sean was born, we learned that he has Down syndrome. That was 11 years ago. And life with Sean has not always been easy, but Christ does not call us to a life of ease. My wife and I sat with him in the neonatal intensive care unit for 10 days after he was born. We handed him over to a doctor for open heart surgery at four months of age. We held him and nursed him back to health. There have been more than a few trips to the hospital since then, not to mention speech therapists, occupational therapists, and early intervention specialists. And most of the burden of this has fallen to my wife. At times, Sean has pushed both of us to our limit. Life with him has often been quite difficult. But any difficulty in raising him is utterly eclipsed by the great blessing that he is in our lives every day. When I think of him, there is a clarity of love that I know in few other places in my life. I have no ambiguity about his value as a human being. He is created a little lower than God, crowned with glory and honor. He bears the divine image. He is fearfully and wonderfully made, and he is a baptized Christian. I know who he is, and I know whose he is. Much of the world doesn't. Much of the world would suggest it would be better had he never been born but they're wrong. There are two ways, one of life and one of death. And there's a great difference between the two ways. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is the one true church, apostolic and universal whose holy faith let us now declare page eight or number 881 in your hymnal.
I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.